Uh, I'm Steve Fraser, and uh, I'm a labor historian. Uh, and I've written a number of uh, books about labor and uh, history in America. And uh, one of the reasons I think I was drawn to do that kind of historical writing and research is because of the family I grew up with in. Uh, my parents were both uh, uh, came of age during the Great Depression and the New Deal. They were strong partisans of the New Deal and of left-wing politics during the New Deal. Uh, at the core of those politics was a belief in the power of the social of the labor movement, not only to organize industrial workers and bring some modicum of industrial democracy to the workplace, but also to bring social justice more generally uh, to American life. And the labor movement was in the vanguard not only of uh, of uh, industrial democracy, but for such things as social security and unemployment insurance and minimum wage legislation, and even things like health care, universal health care, which we don't have today, but the labor movement back then tried to to uh, 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 advocate and, 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 uh, and so on. So I, I came of age myself inheriting a set of uh, uh, beliefs and anticipations and expectations about the labor movement as a force for social justice. And uh, when I decided to become an American historian, it was more or less natural for me to gravitate towards uh, that subject of, uh, for, for research. And in fact, my dissertation was a study of a man who was vital during the New Deal, during the Roosevelt years, uh, for the labor movement. He was one of the founders of the Congress of Industrial Organizations, which was the mass industrial union movement of that period, a man named Sidney Hillman, and was very close to the Roosevelt regime. In fact, he was a kind of liaison between the New Deal Democratic Party and the militant industrial union movement of that period. So that was the first, that was my dissertation. It became the first book I wrote, a kind of quasi-biography of Sidney Hillman. Um, so, uh, with what you were just saying, um, can you talk about what are the origins of unionization in the United States? Well, unions in the United States go all the way back to really the founding of the country in the late 18th and early 19th century. Some of the handicraft artisans of that period, uh, printers and barrel makers and shoemakers, began to organize craft unions. Uh, in order to uh, do the things that unions do, uh, to get better wages for themselves, to control the conditions under which they were employed, and so on. So the labor movement is, is as ancient an institution in America as the nation itself. Um, it's gone through various periods. Sometimes it's, the labor movement has been more powerful. For long periods of time, it's been very weak. Uh, during the period of American industrialization in the late 19th and early 20th century, the union movement was quite weak, and all the power and leverage belonged to the major corporate, what used to be called the robber barons, the Andrew Carnegie's and John Rockefeller's and J.P. Morgan's of that era, really called the tune. They were very anti-union, and unions and other forms of labor protests were met with very violent repression, both by corporations who uh, employed their own private armies to deal with organizing workers, and on the part of the government, state governments, local governments, even the federal government, again and again, would deploy military force to break up union movements and some of the great strikes of the 19th century, like the Pullman strike in 1894, uh, or the great railroad strike of 1877. In most of these cases, not all, the, 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 the uh, union movement and the labor movement more generally was defeated, but kept resisting and organizing and fighting back. Um, all of that, and some, some of these victories, I should say, were, were, were some victories were, were truly monumental and important ones and lasted. But generally speaking, up until the Great Depression, the labor movement was on the defensive and weak, and most of the industrial labor force was unorganized. So when you get to the Great Depression of the 1930s, what you're looking at is most of basic industry, steel and rubber and auto and coal, uh, well not coal, that was unionized, most of these basic industries are unorganized. Workers had been trying for decades, they were met with blacklists and uh, mass firings and court injunctions and so on, so they couldn't organize. But in the 1930s, all of that changed. It changed for two reasons, both because 
uh, groups of very militant workers organized on the shop floor and won the, and some of these were left-wing organizers, members of the Communist Party or the Socialist Party or other left-wing organizations, determined to organize at the grassroots. And they built very powerful and very resilient movements in places like the auto industry, for example. And, and they were able to engage in some of the most stunning uh, strikes in American history, the most famous of which is the Flint sit-down strike at the General Motors plant in Flint, Michigan, where the workers actually occupied the factory. Instead of walking out and forming a picket line, they occupied the plants. And these sit-down strikes that began in Flint spread all over the country. Um, they were very powerful movements. The other reason the union movement succeeds is because the New Deal administration, the Roosevelt administration, in order to sustain itself as a powerful political force in the country began to either be neutral towards the labor movement, which previous presidents had not been, or even in some cases to side with uh, the union movement. So that, for example, Roosevelt, with some reluctance, backed the Wagner Act, the, the, which is the National Labor Relations Act, which gave workers the right for the first time in American history to engage in collective bargaining and compelled employers to negotiate with them. It became against the law if a majority in a, in a plant voted to organize. It became against the law for the employer to refuse to negotiate. He had to negotiate and he negotiate in good faith. Mm -hmm. now, otherwise, he could be fined and so on. Roosevelt supported that with some reluctance. He began to support some of the other causes that labor was associated with. For instance, uh, minimum wage and maximum hour legislation, which was finally passed in 1937, which put a floor under wages, uh, at least for some workers. You know, it, 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 it exempted uh, various kinds of agricultural and domestic workers, uh, uh, but many other workers were covered by that. It's the first time in American history that there was national legislation to establish minimum wages and maximum hours. Social Security, which we all take for granted today, didn't exist until the New Deal. So it also was a way of securing for working people a future in retirement, which they had never had before. Once you grew old in American industry, if you survive long enough, because the rate of industrial accidents and fatalities was tremendous because there was no safety legislation. But if you made it to old age, you had to rely basically on your family to get by or you ended up in the poorhouse. Social Security made it possible for people at a minimal level, but still to depend on the government to provide a way of retiring in some decency. So all of this happens in the 1930s. And it changed the face of the country. For the first time, the government took the responsibility at the urging of this mass labor movement to guarantee a certain level of social welfare. We would not be talking about a welfare system today, aid to uh, 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 dependent children and, and other forms of welfare legislation, had it not been for the labor movement of the 1930s and 40s. In terms of working off of that, um, uh, what was... What were conditions like for a industrial worker in, say, 1880? It was, uh, a, you know, our ancestors of 1880 and earlier than that, and even after that, used to refer to work in American industry as wage slavery. It's a, it's a term that's foreign to us today, but was commonplace all through the 19th century. It meant two things. It meant, in a practical way, that the conditions of labor approximated a kind of slavery. There were no rights on the workplace. You had no right to protest. You were employed at will. At any time the employer wanted to get rid of you, he had full legal right to do so. He could determine how fast you worked, how long you worked, what wages you got. You had no rights whatsoever, almost like a, a slave. You, he, he was under no obligation to provide the kind of health and safety uh, uh, protections uh, that to some degree we can now take for granted on the job. Um, you were a kind of uh, automaton. You were that Charlie Chaplin character in modern times, eaten alive by the machinery of mass production. Um, and that's why people, that's one reason people called it wage slavery. The other reason is more fundamental and profound. It meant that 
uh, suddenly, for the first time in American history, millions and millions of people could no longer support themselves. They were at the mercy of those who owned the capital resources of the country if they were going to be employed, earn a living, support their family. That's a kind of slavery, a dependency. Prior to that, people might have owned their own store, their own handicraft a shop, their own piece of land to farm on. All of that changed in 1880. You're asking about 1880 uh, and thereabouts. When instead people became proletarians, and proletarians meant they had no way of supporting themselves unless they were employed, which meant they were at the mercy of the lords of industry. In fact, they were called lords of the loom, uh, referring to the textile industry, for example, because they exercised that kind of lordly power over ordinary people. Uh, so it was, uh, and Wage slavery was a term used by everybody, even journalists and novelists and even presidents, because this was a new kind of phenomenon in American life, that millions of people lacked the wherewithal to take care of themselves unless some employer hired them. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just curious. I think we have a question a bit like this, but going I, and I and I really appreciate your point of view from a historian level. But do you feel just to bring it kind of current, and maybe we can go back again to, to history? Do you feel like we're getting back to those wage slavery times? Do you feel like there's, yes, there's, a, there's so. a parallel? Yes, I do think so. I think people are uh, are are increasingly at the mercy of employers, perhaps in different ways than they were then. A, a lot of the protections that thanks to the union movement of both the 1880s, but more more recently of the 1930s, that were instituted to, to protect workers against the autocracy of their employers. They've been whittled away. The National Labor Relations Act, one of the landmark pieces of legislation of the 1930s is barely in force now. The National Labor Relations Board is dominated by business uh, representatives from business. Most of their rulings, uh, in fact, the board is often used by employers to delay making decisions about whether a union, uh, a group of workers has uh, won the right to be recognized in their place of employment. Uh, all, the, all the social welfare benefits that emerged out of the 19th 1930s and 40s are being whittled away by an austerity regime, and all and the union movement itself is a shadow of what it once was. At one point in American history, say 1950 or 55, uh, more than a third of the workforce in America was were in unions, and that may seem that's a hefty number, but it's not as hefty as you might think. It's it's heftier than that, is what I mean to say, because many other employers. Who, what they did was they granted to their unorganized workers the same benefits that these unionized workers have for fear that if they did not, the union would be in their plan. So well over a third of the workforce was organized. They had protections against arbitrary firing. They enjoyed all kinds of fringe benefits like pensions and vacations and health care, all those kinds of things that we used to take for granted. Now that labor force, that unionized labor force represents maybe, depending on who you're counting, whether you're counting both public and private sector workers, maybe 10 or 11 percent in the private sector, maybe 8 percent, 7 percent. That is thanks to the deindustrialization that happened over the last 25 or 30 years. Unions were destroyed. We American politics became captive of free market ideology, which was profoundly anti-labor and anti-union. So the union movement itself doesn't begin to exercise the leverage it once did. And with it go all those fringe benefits, which are not just fringe benefits. They're, they're the way you live. A, a, they're the protections you depend on not to be helpless. So that it's rare now that an employer will actually provide employer-funded health insurance or pensions. Uh, uh, increasingly, you're either at the mercy of the stock market for your pension or you have no pension at all. Um, you know, and 
it, it, today we have the growth of temporary employment, which is a real curse because it leaves you utterly at the mercy of the marketplace. And, and, and you, have, you, have, you have no tenure in your employment. Um, and, and the way industry has evolved of late is that a big industry subcontracts out its work to all kinds of small subcontractors who hire workers temporarily, fire them at will. So yes, I do think that we're approximating the kind of helplessness or enslavement, if you will, I'm exaggerating, obviously, that workers experienced in the late 19th century. Yeah, no, that, that, that answers it beautifully. Thank you. Yeah, it's, very, it's a very precarious situation for many people. Yeah. And, and that might have been true in, in 1880. It was no longer true in 1950, and now it's true again. What are things that... Um, that Workers well, I mean, you know, not I, you choice. know, there, there's there are people today who loathe and scapegoat the labor movement. Uh, for they say that you know the labor movement is uh, to blame for whatever. You know, I wonder what all these union haters would say if uh, if they were told that this institution they hate is responsible for bringing them the weekend, mm -hmm. meaning. Uh, by which, which I'm sure they all value and uh, would not give up on pain of death, um, you know, before the union movement had the kind of power that it did finally have by the mid-20th century, employers, uh, this kind of industrial autocracy, dictated everything, including how many days a week you worked, how many hours a day you worked, like you could work 12, 13, 14 hours, children under the age of 10, even under the age of 8, picking in strawberry fields and, and, and so on in the South, were working uh, incredible numbers of hours. There was no legislation, no regulation of that. It's the union movement that begins to civilize that kind of uh, dog-eat-dog -dog Darwinian capitalism, um, and including winning such basic kinds of uh, things we take for granted today, like the eight-hour day. In fact, we may take the eight-hour day for granted today, but actually millions of employers no longer enjoy the eight-hour day. They once did when the union movement was strong. They no longer do now, millions of them anyway, because the union movement is so weak and because politicians both in both parties have have undermine the kinds of protections the union movement uh, once uh, won. So uh, it, these are, these are uh, uh, very, very kind of, also, I think a lot of times when people think of unions, they think only of strictly material things, wages, how, how long you worked, what kind of fringe benefits you might have. But the union movement is, first of all, a democratic movement. It's a movement which brings democracy to the workplace. Instead of saying, oh, yes, the owner of that private property is an autocrat and his will is, is, is law, it says, no, we're all involved in this uh, enterprise, if you will, together, and there are certain rights that ought to adhere in the people who work there. And, 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 and the only way those rights can be exercised, say, to defend you, uh, worker, uh, workers against arbitrary firing or abuse by a foreman or f compelled to work endless hours or, or compelled to work without the protections of, uh, 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 of uh, of his health, is, is to exercise that collectively. The worker by himself is powerless to come up against the power of his employer. Only collectively can he exercise, and therefore democratically, can he civilize and democratize the workplace. And a lot of times when workers organize, they of course wanted higher wages or less hours or so on, but they also wanted a voice. They wanted their rights as human beings to be treated uh, to be treated with dignity, and and uh, increasingly nowadays that's less and less the case uh, for people, um, uh, in part because of the withering away of the uh, of the labor movement. If you just want to touch on really quickly, like what you think. Um, you know, things that were fought and won, like, for example, we do still have the weekend. We don't really have the eight-hour day anymore, you know, like you just touched on. But what was sort of fought for? <laughs> with, with workplace surveillance as widespread electronic surveillance, you're on call 24-7 right. to get the eight-hour day, yeah. <laughs> the 24-hour day. But I'm curious what you think from a historian's perspective, do you think are, is most in threat, we're in threat of in our modern day right now as well? Like those things that we've that we've won and we take for granted that we're, we, that actually, you know, 
are most in threat at the moment or could be in threat of th things that we haven't even thought about? Well, I think the thing that's most in threat, and this may strike you as odd, is democracy. All of these other things are obviously in threat. Our, our, our ability to live decent lives with decent incomes, uh, to enjoy a certain amount of security, both when we're working and after we're working, when we retire, uh, the well-being of our children, their ability to be educated and well-educated, all these things are at threat. But in the end of the day, I think the most powerful threat is to democracy, that without a powerful labor movement, working people have no vehicle for their voice to be heard, for their power to be respected, for their dignity to be acknowledged. And that is the gravest threat. If you think of America as a place that is supposed to honor democracy, increasingly we are, we are, we are a foe, a fake democracy, and part of the reason for that is the, is the, is the weakness of organized labor. Yes. Can you um, talk about that a bit more in terms of, you know, we touched on it at the, the beginning of the interview, but, uh, you know, obviously we know in terms of tactics, um, so there's labor, there are tactics in workplaces themselves in terms of strikes and, and that sort of thing, but also um, what, you know, in more specifics, what were some of the things that labor was able to do when you talk about, you know, labor as a voice for the worker, labor as lobby, lobbyer versus, uh, though, you know, versus not being a lot, versus individuals yeah. not being able well, to lobby. I think that uh, what you're talking about is labor's one-time considerable influence in the political arena. The Democratic Party, which today is a party that... Uh, honors uh, hedge fund operators and Wall Street businessmen and and uh, is obedient to corporate America was once not not so. There was a time when there was a kind of, uh, when the labor movement's influence inside the Democratic Party was powerful enough, and I'm talking about not just the New Deal, but the decades that followed the New Deal in the 40s and 50s and into the 60s, when the well-being of working people was expressed not universally and not as much as it might have been, but to a far larger degree than it is today through the Democratic Party, through uh, its representatives in Congress, through its presidents. After all, the, the war on poverty that we associate in the 60s with Lyndon Johnson would not have happened without the powerful voice both of the civil rights movement and the labor movement. And in fact, the civil rights movement, despite a long record of labor movement um, internal segregation and so on. The labor movement was a major factor. The March on Washington, which we all honor, was a march for jobs and freedom. Most people don't remember that today, but that Martin Luther King March was a march organized not only by all the civil rights organizations of that period, but by all the major labor movement uh, unions, the UAW, the, uh, Walter Ruther was on the podium, the that is the president of the, uh, the United Auto Workers in that period. Um, so these kinds of great social achievements, civil rights, uh, the war on poverty, Medicare, right? That Medicare is part of the war on poverty. Medicaid, these things come out of a moment when the labor movement is exercising significant influence inside the Democratic Party, an influence which it has almost none of today. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of that, like, what are things, are there, is, is there anything based on what the labor movement was able to do historically that we can use today, like, that we can try to like, learn from and maybe use to bring back that influence, both in terms of unionization within uh, uh, workplaces, but also, uh, get back that political voice? The first thing is, uh, to quote a, a, a famous labor organizer of the early 20th century, Joe Hill, don't mourn organize. He meant don't mourn his death. He was executed by the state, uh, but organize. You have to organize. You have to get back to the labor movement. has to get back. Easier said than done. Organizing is a very difficult. It's a, it's a scary business. Employers have a not enormous power. People don't appreciate what it is 
nowadays and back then to join a union. It's a scary thing. You're, you're risking your livelihood, the livelihood, the well-being of your family. You're, you're standing up to the kind of intimidation that often the employer deploys against you. Uh, it's, it takes a lot of guts and courage and imagination to do that. It's not just, oh, you sign a union card and it's all, it's all hunky-dory and now you're a member of the union. It doesn't work like that. So people need to organize and, and so on. But they also need, and I think one of the hopeful signs of our most recent past, is this Bernie Sanders-like movement inside the Democratic Party um, where people for the first time in a long time are, so to speak, calling a spade a spade. And they're saying, you know, who runs the Democratic Party, who runs the country? It's Wall Street and big business. And we're going to form a political movement which tries to take the power out of their hands about all the key issues that are facing us. And I think that movement shocked people in, in the degree of its success. Who would have ever imagined just two years ago that someone who avowedly is a socialist could nearly get nominated as the, and might have been nominated as the, as the Democratic Party president had not the forces opposing him uh, done engaged in some skullduggery. Um, but it's an amazing turn of events that someone like Sanders could now command this kind of sympathy. He's apparently the most popular politician in America today by all polls I've ever seen. Uh, and part of that is his integrity and his honesty, the fact he's been saying the damn, same damn thing for 25 years that people believe him, but also because people are beginning to see that this kind of what is called neoliberal capitalism has a very strong family resemblance to the Darwinian capitalism our ancestors had to live under, and they've had enough of that and want a real change in the system. So I think that's a hopeful sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, could you also briefly, you had mentioned in terms of the, the things that companies do, like the Part of the reason that it's brave to be in a union is the things that companies do to um, uh, it, go against unions. Can you talk about uh, the history of that? Not you know the what a company does to try to bust sure. unions, prevent unions, and including uh, in, in history of outside consultants that sort of made their money off of it. Well, you know, some of the things that, that employers do today, they did 100 years ago. Or some of the things they did 100 years ago, they're doing again today. Some they don't. Back in the, in the, uh, in the uh, 1880, your favorite year, um, they, they forced, they compelled workers around that time to sign what were called yellow dog contracts. It meant that a, 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 to get a job, you had to sign a contract saying you would never join a union. If you didn't want to sign that contract, you were out. One of the things they also did back then, which they kind of do today a little bit more surreptitiously, is they had blacklists. Blacklists circulated among employers, often in the same industry. The blacklist identified all those people the employer either thought or knew to be union organizers or just union sympathizers. And if you were on that blacklist, you had a very difficult time getting a job anywhere else in that industry. Uh, today... Although it's against the law, employers regularly fire uh, workers at their plants for engaging in union organizing. Then the you, then the organizer or the union that, uh, may file a grievance. You know how long it takes for that grievance to be resolved by the National Labor Relations Board or in the courts? Years. And the employer knows that. So that even if he's found guilty two or three years down the road, that union has long since dissipated. It's all gone. So he's playing the law, using the law to break the law, mm -hmm. is what he's in effect doing. So, or do you have what used to be against the law. These company meet, let's say you're a union, you're organizing plant X. The employer and the NLRB now under its, its pro-employer auspices, let's say you're employed, you hold a meeting, a, what's called a captive meeting. All employees are obligated to attend that meeting. At the meeting, the employer, either through outside consultants or through his own managerial people, tell you all the reasons why it's terrible to join a union. And they can make up any, the company's going to go out of business. You know what? It's against the National Labor Relations Board to say to un, unionizing employers, if you join this union, I'm going out of business. Or if you join this union, I'm going to move to another location. That is actually against the law. Nobody knows that because that law is never enforced. Under the Wagner Act, that was, again, that was considered 
an a, a anti-labor practice. There were a series of practices outlined by the law which said if you're an employer, you can't do this. Now they do it all the time. So it's those kinds of things which happened back in 1900 and are happening again today to make it very, very difficult uh, for workers to uh, confront. What were some of the tactics of organizing? Uh, you know, at the beginning, um, what strategies were successful? Uh, historically, what might be successful today um, that may or may not be the same well, as historically? There are many uh, tactics. Boycotts, for example, was a commonly used um, tactic by union organizing workers. They would go out to the consuming public and to fellow union, unionists in other industries and say, boycott the products of industry X because they're anti-labor and they're not, they're not negotiating with us. Do you know now under a law called the Taft-Hartley Act, which was passed in 1948, it is against the law to engage in secondary, what are called secondary boycotts, boycotts against an, an employer who's not negotiating fairly. And it's also, what used to be a common tactic, sympathy strikes, right? You know what a sympathy strike is? I strike and workers at another plant, say the, say the Teamsters, they, 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 they say the workers at Walmart are striking. Okay, let's say that for, mm -hmm. <laughs> for an improbable one. But the workers <laughs> at Walmart are striking. The Teamsters, under the old days, uh, would drive up to that plant, see the pickets, and refuse to deliver the goods they had in their truck because they were members of the Teamsters Union. That's called a sympathy strike. The Taft-Hartley Act in 1948 outlawed sympathy strikes. That's like outlawing an emotion, a social emotion. Mm -hmm. That is sympathy. Now, you can't do that. It's against the law. But maybe you could do it. Sympathy strikes, boycotts, sit-down strikes. Obviously, I mentioned the Flint, and there were sit-down strikes all over the country, in department stores, in steel mills, in auto plants, everywhere. Um, is another tactic requiring enormous courage. After all, you're occupying private property. That's transgressive. You're not supposed to do that. And they did that. So that's, you know, that takes a movement of some imagination and, and courage. Um, there are other tactics being used today. For instance, co companies value their corporate reputations. And if you can, a lot of unions now will try to uh, uh, darken the reputation of their employers by notice, noting their investment. Say it used to be in apartheid back in when apartheid in South Africa, you would you would uh, you would you would uh, um, you were trying to organize, but you said this company does business with apartheid South Africa. So there are corporate campaigns to show uh, uh, the corporation's connection to various kinds of. Um, Cause, I mean, there are many, many taxes. The most extraordinary is something that only happens under very special conditions. That's something called a mass strike. A mass strike is not just a strike against a particular employer. It may begin that way, but it was very common in the 19th century, a, a strike that began, say, among railroad workers. They would then spread into the surrounding uh, city, countryside, villages, because there was so much sympathy for them, for the cause, that you would have farmers coming into town. To, you would have armed confrontations between workers and their neighbors and their families and so on. And, uh, so mass strikes are very extraordinary events. They only happen under exceptional circumstances. They're not a tactic. They are pre-revolutionary. So <laughs> you can't bring them into being by issuing a call for one. <laughs> Um, I have just one quick question. What would you say to somebody uh, who would be afraid of like getting fired if they if they took part in a sympathy strike? I mean, that's that's a very real question. I think. What would it you is a real say? question. What would you say? Uh, it, there's no magic answer to that. The only real answer to that is that the employer it would be loath to fire everybody. So if there is a collective. Um, uh, movement, a collective organization, he has to fire if everybody is doing this. Um, but you're right. They, these are fears. They're everyday fears. They're legitimate fears. Um, you know, you can promise him legal help, but it's a weak read uh, because uh, the law is very slow to adjudicate these kinds of cases. Um, it's difficult. The real power is in his 
in his fellowship with his with his or her uh, fellow workers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Steve. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Steve. Thanks yeah. for taking the time. Happy to do it. Really, bye -bye. gems yeah. of knowledge. Thank yeah. you.